guys welcome to my channel in today's video i will be talking about the topic image processing yes you guessed it right so this video is going to be one of my most favorite playlist and i really loved this topic during my engineering so without any further delay let us get started So for those of you wondering whether you should start image processing as a new subject or you already know image processing, well and great. But for those who really want to start image processing as a new subject, it is my, I think it's my duty to actually tell you why you should learn image processing. So the first very reason could be because you are really fascinated by how you perceive the world and everything in this world is an image. Or you may be very fascinated about how your Instagram filters work, right? They also have a lot of image processing, you know, those cute bunny filters in Snapchat and Instagram. So that is again image processing. Or let's say you want to go into more computational and more scientific way of thinking about image processing. That would be your image processing through a satellite or, you know, cancer detection, x-rays, gamma rays, etc. All of that are all image processing. But you know what? Throughout this entire image processing course, you would be involved with a lot of math. Okay, okay, wait, do not worry. I'm going to try to make this lecture very simple and try to make it as intuitive as possible. So if you are the person who does not like math, no worries. I'm going to try to simplify it. You just need to understand the intuition behind image processing the math behind image processing. So let, if you are thinking whether to pursue image processing as a subject, think about it, learn about it. Well, this is a great place. I would try to upload videos as frequently as possible. And let's create this playlist a memorable one. As and when needed, I would try to include a little bit of coding into it so that, you know, nothing is possible without coding. So I would try to include coding and the software I will be using is MATLAB. Also, I would try to explain the concepts through PPTs and if required, pen and paper. So without any further delay, let's get started to the first and the foremost that's the steps required for image processing. So as you can see over here, so uh, this is the book that I have been using is Digital Image Processing by Raphael C. Gondalis and Richard E. Woods. So this is the textbook that I would be referring to for images. And uh, so as you can see in this whole uh, picture, it explains it's quite self-explanatory. So I would be there are some major steps for image processing. The first being image accusation. So this step is basically how you perceive the image that's through your camera through the lens through your eyes etc how you store it etc would be thought up in this unit called image accusation then you have image enhancement so after you store an image there would be some sort of distortion right so that how do you enhance the image would be covered in this lecture called the image enhancement after that, you have a uh, image restoration. So let's say you have already a digitalized image. So how do you restore the image? How do you get back the original image from a compressed image? That is what is called image restoration. Also, you have color image processing. So you have like various colors that that are actually depicting a picture, right? So you have the HSV, you have the RGB. So these are the various forms of representation of colors, CMY, etc. So that is what color image representation is. You have wavelengths and multi-resolution processing like the Haar wavelength. These are all compression techniques. So again, you have compression, morphological processing. It's again how you actually try to, you know, get certain um, aspects of your image segmentation representation and description and organ object recognition. So object recognition is like the last stage where you actually try to 
recognize certain objects like faces, hands, etc. So um, the whole journey through image processing is like this and you require a lot of knowledge and a lot of techniques and new techniques are always being found here and there. So um, this is the entire chart flow that you actually go ahead with um, image processing. So in each lecture, I would try to divide it as much as possible, simplify it as much as possible, and you know, tell you as much information that you require. There is a lot of information available, but only a few that you actually need to keep in mind, and I would try to give them to you all. So um, with this, you can see over here, this is your actual computer. So basically, you do all your image processing through your computer. So this is your computer, you have image displays, that's your LCDs, etc. You have a mass storage, that's your hard disk. And then you have some image processing software, anything for that instance, your MATLAB, etc. There are special image processing hardware tools also required, like GPUs, etc. Sometimes you would require a printer to actually print the image, so that you need hard copies of the image, and you have the image sensors. So basically, you try to have a problem domain, you sense the image, and after you sense the image, you, you process the image through specialized hardware, including the image processing software, you feed it into the computer. This computer would store the image or display the image, or you can also take a hard copy of the image. So this is what the picture actually says, and this is all in courtesies with the book that I have mentioned to you. So. Um, this is what your entire image processing thing is. This is actually a nutshell of your computer system and how, what, where images are stored, displayed, and what are the roles of images in various aspects of the computer. So with this, go to the first image accusation and the natural way of accusing image, that is, intercepting images from the world is your eye so we all know that the eye in our human body is actually like the camera lens that helps in capturing the image and seeing this world as beautiful at it as it is so our eyes have various organs and the most important one is the lens which helps in capturing the image from the outside world to the photosensitive cells that's known as the rods and the cones that is present on the outer lining of this eye and with the help of these rods and cones your optic nerve gets instigated and it sends a signal to your brain which actually interprets that image so there is a lot of complex things that goes behind an eye and I would not be diving deep into what your eye does because this is not a biology session. But I would tell you this, that the main ingredients for your eye to actually see the world is the light. That's obvious because the light around you the, hits an object and reflects and hits, goes into the pupil, takes in the lens and actually captures the image right over here, which is known as your bright spot. So that and your cells like the rods and the cones are the ones that are photosensitive, that is sensitive to light. They instigate a certain signal on exposure to light and then sends the signal up the way all to your brain. So that is how exactly your eye works. Uh, not exactly, but actually a brief one. So uh, with that, actually, this is where this is actually your eye and you have the you know you can see over here this is actually a blind spot so this is the place where you you know no images can be seen that means there's absolutely zero uh, uh, cones and over here you have the fur uh, this is the place where you know the direct light falls in hits the image over here forms the image over here this is the place of the maximum cones present in your eye so uh, this is a point with zero, absolutely no um, cones. So wh what do I mean by cones and rods and why are there different terminologies for cones and rods? So first and foremost, it's just simple. Cones are basically trying to, you know, get in your 
colored portion of the light so you know it, it is more sensitive to bright light and helps in getting more colored vision in daytime so that is the reason why you actually uh, like you know see the world so colorful in in the presence of light because your cones are very active whereas your rods are more as a dim it's more sensitive to dim light and helps you in night vision so though you cannot it is more into the blue and the black regions of the color and you cannot see the objects as bright and colorful as they are in the night but you can see and at least distinguish between them so you know what eat your carrots guys because they help in restoring your rods and does not cause night blindness so um that is the just basic difference of rods and cones so cones are basically you're sensitive to light colors they help in you know seeing bright colors around the daytime they are more active whereas your rods are more active in the night and help you see the light color uh, the night or the darker shades of colors so like i said the cones are very much present in zero degree uh, zero degree and it's very much absent in the blind spot which is actually shown over here so you can see that your rods indicated in blue are absolutely less at the zero degree because your cones are the highest over there and your rods are higher over every other region other than the zero degree but uh, the uh, rods are again you know like there is no uh, the blind spot is basically the spot where there is no receptors so that is the point where the entry of the optic nerve so obviously you cannot have any light image forming in this region because there is no surface behind it right so it's something like that you need a you need a screen for the light from the projector to fall onto it there is no screen present at that region guys so there is absolutely a blind spot so as you can see that overall the number of rods are more in your eyes than your cones and as a result you are more sensitive to you know these uh, dark vision so it is like you know you require more cones to act, uh, more rods to actually visible you see the see in darkness so that is how our eye actually works and it's an amazing image accusation tool so how so the basic concept of how you actually perceive color is actually really shown over here so when you see an object to be green that means the white light that is the light from your sun so the light from the sun or some bulb or anything of that side the white light it hits an object and if it is considered to be green that means all other colors from the white light you all know right white light is made of all the vip or the rainbow colors so all the colors are absorbed except for the color it's actually supposed to be and that is what is reflected and it is shown to your eyes and that is how you perceive a color to be green yellow orange etc so this cylinder is green because it is reflecting green light and absorbing all other colors and as a result you see a world that's as beautiful as it's supposed to be so overall you have you know our you, our eyes though being an excellent accusation tool and it has a wide range of you know sensitive color uh, sensitive to various range of light okay so um when i say that um it is sensitive to various range of light as in it can see the most brightest element that's that's a glare limit beyond which it cannot like it just thresholds it to that limit so that means anything beyond this is actually a glare limit it's all the same color to you and the scotopic vision that is your night vision that is it can go as dim as this it, it anything below this is thresholded to this value so the eye is sensitive to this wide variety region of you know color but uh, at one point at any instance of time you can only be sensitive to a small range of colors all right so that is what is called brightness adaptation level that is the current sensitive it's sensitive to only a certain range of um a certain range of brightness at one particular instance of time and this is what's shown over here all right so and and the greatest analogy that i can think about this entire phenomena is when you come from a very uh, from outside let's say you're you're running in the hot sun and then you suddenly come to your classrooms so what is the thing that you actually notice that it takes some time for your eyes to actually adjust to the 
surroundings because the outside was really hot and there was a lot of light and as a result your you had sensitivity towards only a certain range over the higher intensities but as soon as you come to the class you 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 take some time because it is like the intensities are lesser and you know you cannot really actually think about it right so you cannot uh, figure out because it's like you find everything black for a moment so your eyes take time to adjust and that is the reason why you have something called the brightness adaptation so um another important uh, thing that i really find um i want to tell you is uh, something called the weber's ratio so um what i mean by weber's ratio is basically that all right uh the your eyes can be sensitive to only a certain range of colors okay so when i mean a certain range of colors uh, what i say is uh, if you have a background full of let's say orange and then you have a slighter increment so the intensity of orange color that is i and you have a slight increment over the orange color that's a slightly greater intensity slightly towards the red or yellow and but it's a it's a different shade but at times you just cannot notice it right because it's just overlapping between them but it is definitely a different shade of that orange color so that is what but still you cannot differentiate so eyes cannot make that out so what weber's ratio says that if delta i that is your change in the intensity is not bright enough that means your subject says no that means it cannot predict it so that indicates a smaller weber ratio right so when you have a weber ratio which is weber ratio that is small it indicates that it is not able to identify it if you if you have a smaller weber ratio then you can identify and you have a greater sense of identifying a color differentiation if you have a larger weber ratio that means it takes time for you to actually differentiate between the colors and why do i say this see delta i see it is a change in the intensity so if this value is very large that means if you have a weber ratio which is very large your eyes has a weber ratio that's very large that means you cannot differentiate colors that easily you require certain amount of you know um uh, it, it should be very obvious for you to actually distinguish it because you cannot distinguish between two identical colors but if your weber ratio is very small then you can definitely identify between two different colors so um that is your weber uh, ratio then uh when you actually think about this all these images how they are stored etc they are stored in this form of an array right so you can see uh, you have various um, array representations but since the video is getting too long i would like to stop it here and you know continue this in the next session so until then i hope you've understood what i'm trying to say like why image processing is important and how what is image accusation so basically accusation means you know trying to get information from the outside world and storing it in the form of any way so the natural accusation device that you have in your body is your eyes but in the next session i'm going to be talking about the accusation devices that our computer uses and i'm promising you this would definitely be interesting so all right guys bye see you in the next session